Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Betsy Kenyon, and I'm the marketing coordinator here at Elevate Wealth Advisory. If you're new to us, we are a wealth advising firm in Athens, Georgia. We were founded 40 years ago in 1982 by Chuck Vickery as Vickery Financial Services. And since that time, we've now grown to a team of 11 people. We rebranded a couple years ago as Elevate Wealth Advisory. Um, before I introduce you to our CEO and then also to our guest speaker, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items with you. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see both a chat box and a Q&A box. So if any time today throughout our presentation, you have a question for our guest speaker, Christian, please put your um, question right in there and we'll be sure to answer it. If for some reason we run short on time, we'll go ahead and get back to you through email. Um, now I would like to introduce you to our president and CEO, Deanne Rosso. Deanne joined our firm in 2005 as an intern back when we were still Vickery Financial Services. She's a proud University of Georgia graduate, and she eventually took over the company in 2018 as our president and CEO. Deanne lives in Watkinsville with her husband, Brandon, and they have three boys, and they all enjoy cheering on the dogs together. Welcome, Deanne. So glad to have you here with us. Thank you, Betsy. Glad to be here today. And thank you all for joining us on our April uh, webinar um, from Elevate Wealth Advisory. Um, you know, the topic of today's webinar is the top five behavioral biases that we experience in investing. And, you know, the thing is, there are so many things that go into investing that we have absolutely no control over. Um, we can't control inflation. We can't control gas prices. We can't control stock market. We can't control world governments. But one thing that we can control is our own behavior. And you may be thinking like, what? I'm, I'm really good at controlling my own behavior. I'm really good at controlling my emotions. Um, and that is one of the most important factors in our portfolio success is for us to be able to make not only make smart decisions with our money, but then to stick with the plan and to overcome some of those behavioral biases. And while we all think we have good behavior, sometimes we're prone to what feels like a laundry list of less than ideal behaviors, um, different bias, biases, overconfidence, framing issues, um, all the things that we may not even know, um, we may not even be conscious um, sometimes of the ways that we feel and how that makes us react. So learning um, how, um, Learning how we behave is just as important as behaving in the right way. And that's why today we decided to focus on behavioral biases. So I'm happy to introduce Christian Newton. Uh, Christian is a vice president with Dimensional Fund Advisors. Welcome, Christian. Thank you, Deanne. Please, pleased to be with you today. Thank you for joining us and, and for helping share with us today some of these behavioral biases and how we may overcome those things. So Christian helps financial advisors leverage um, dimensional fund advisors, capital markets research, and how that applies to portfolio and practice management. Um, previously, Christian spent 10 years in dimensional's marketing group, and he created materials for advisors, and he holds um, a BA in history from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And his online writing has been profiled in the New York Times and in Entertainment Weekly. I'm interested in that, Christian. Um, and Christian also has a seven-year-old son, so they're doing all the sports things. So any given week, night, or weekend, you probably find him on a sports field um, with his seven-year-old and um, living large through the eyes of, of that little boy. So welcome, <laughs> Christian. We're happy to have you with us today. Thank you, Deanne. Yeah, so far, a three-sport athlete. We'll see if that holds up. Uh, thank you very much for having me today, and thank you everyone for giving me a little time today. That was a terrific introduction into what I want to examine with you. The number one thing I want to avoid is I don't want you to think that these behavioral biases, as social scientists call them, they are not a function of your intelligence. They're not a function of your education. They're not a function of your uh, emotional stability or your equanimity. Rather, they are things that are cognitively baked in to decisions that we make every day. That's what I want to explore with you. I want to bring up some slides to do that. I'm going to get all the way. I'm going to make an argument that ends with how we invest, our perspective as investors. But I actually want to zoom way out to start. Because to me, this evidence, these ideas... Our decision-making when it comes certainly to investing, but also our decision-making when it comes to spending money 
even any economic decision, we can expand it even farther. I can argue any logical decision, according to psychological research, is fraught with ways that we fail to make uh, perfectly optimal decisions. It's not my goal really to change your behavior in this call. Rather, what I want to do in the next few minutes, hopefully to have a little bit of fun, but I want to share with you this evidence. I want to give you just a little bit more perspective perhaps than you have. I believe these are ideas that you absolutely can apply to your wealth, how you manage your wealth, especially your investments. But I also believe you can apply them to a lot of other decisions that we make with money. So I want to cover a lot of ground. The only other thing that I'll say uh, by way of introduction is the following. Of course, through the magic of Zoom, I'm able to connect with you wherever you are. Uh, the upside of that is that we can connect. The downside is that I cannot see or hear you. And I don't want to just quote a lot of dry academic research. Uh, I believe that would be boring. Rather, what I want to do, even in the limited way that we can connect right here, I want to try to recreate a few famous psychological experiments that examine the quality of our decision making. I want to make this as interactive as possible. Now, I can't see you, you can't see your peers who are on this call, but I want to share with you some of these experiments, have you kind of run them as thought experiments, and then I'll share with you uh, what the original research collected. I want to give you a chance to compare your intuition, your perspective to what it is that social science has taught us about this subject. I want to do all of that more or less in the next 35 minutes and reserve a lot of time for questions. We are going to be moving at a very fast pace. If there's something you hear you want to hear more detail about, something you want to interrogate at the next level of detail, I absolutely want to try to answer those questions if I can. So please, as we go, I believe you've got the Q&A feature available in your Zoom interface. Drop those questions in, and then I think we're going to surface those questions as we wrap up. All that being said, thank you for your patience. There's one more thing I want to do before we move on. Because I have your undivided attention, I want to start in kind of a strange way. I want to start by sharing with you some, uh, some vacation photos. Don't worry, it'll be over really quick. Few photographs I just want to share with you, really without explanation. First of all, this photo of a really cute house in Barcelona, Spain. I just wanted you to see that. Uh, moving on, uh, this cute little mailbox that I found in an alley in Florence, Italy. And then we're almost over my little uh, tour here. Up in the Scottish Highlands, I chanced upon this random rocky outcropping. Now, again, these are actually not my true vacation photos. As you may notice, these are credited to strangers on the internet. But there's a reason I want to share them with you and without any expectation. If you see what I see in common across these images, what you see apart from the rocks and the mailbox and the house is you see human faces. Intellectually, you know there is no human face there, but on some level, your brain automatically puts this pattern together and fills in the details. I can't help but see in the side of this blue building, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Here in this mailbox, it's an even stronger signal. I see surprised eyebrows, uh, glowing pupils, a big boxy nose, maybe even a hairline. Uh, and of course, these are works of, of human beings. So it's likely that they were designed intentionally to look like, hu look like human faces. But this is truly, as far as I know, a random work of nature. But it still sees, to me, very strongly to fill in the pattern maybe of an old man a bald head, furrowed brow, nose, wrinkles, chin, frown. All these details are filled in. If your experience was like mine, you can't help but to see a human face, even when you know there is not one that is actually there. If that was the case for you, what you have just experienced in your brain is a form of what psychologists call pattern recognition. That is, again, taking the information in our brain and filling in the gaps to take something random and to make it more meaningful. I want to argue that pattern recognition and the recognition of faces is just one of them. We're going to look at some more complex examples of it. One of its most startling features is you cannot turn it off. You can think of it as an automatic function that your brain, that is the organ in your head, provides to your mind, to your conscious, emotional, decision-making self. That's what I want to explore with you is the automatic cognitive shortcuts that we make 
Again, not a function of our intelligence, our education, our wealth, our success, our happiness, but rather part of the human condition. What do they look like? Do you experience them? And what all can we do about it? That's what I want to explore with you. To get us started, I want to share with you one book. If you want to go to the next level of detail and read a relatively short book on the subject, I can't recommend anything better than Jason Zweig's uh, survey of behavioral finance or the psychology of investing your money and your brain. Now, in the first chapter of this book, Jason shares with us an interesting piece of anatomical evidence. The part of our brain that responds to losses. This is a response to, ab to actual losses in the physical world. The same part of the brain is active when we think about or experience financial or paper losses, even the stock market plummeting maybe on a day that we didn't expect it to. When we think about losses, when we experience loss of any kind, he finds, emotion overwhelms reason. And financial losses are processed in the same areas of the brain that respond to mortal danger. Now, what he's talking about here is the amygdala, the so-called lizard brain at the base of the brain stem. And among other things, it's the amygdala's job to keep us physically safe. It's always asking at a very uh, fundamental level, am I safe? Do I need to do something to protect myself? Now, if you've ever been in a, in a car accident, even a minor one, it's the amygdala that gets you into a protective position at the moment of the crash. It's fully automatic. You don't think about it. It just happens. If you've ever been in a house fire, even a minor one, it's the amygdala that transforms your blood chemistry, gives you the energy and attention you need to get your family out of the house safely. If you've ever been in a bar fight, and perhaps this is not a shared experience, but one or two of us perhaps have survived that experience, we can credit our amygdala for helping to keep us physically safe. But the evidence is the amygdala also steps into action when we experience financial losses, especially at a short-term level. That, as we're going to see, can get us into a lot of trouble. What I'd like to do here, to get us all the way to the top biases and how they are relevant to our task as investors, is I want to start with some really basic biases. Again, to break down that phrase, some basic ways that, according to social scientists, we fail to make optimal decisions. Now, you don't need a, someone with a PhD to share some of these ideas with you. You may not see them in yourself, but my guess is maybe even if you're not watching this alone, if you're watching with a colleague or a spouse, you might see these, these biases, these behaviors in others. Let's start with a few really basic biases, and then I wanna build a case and get us into some that are more remarkable, maybe more unusual, more alien to what you expected. Let me start with a really basic bias. And again, identified by social science overconfidence. The evidence is, especially when we try to make economic decisions, we tend to traffic in overconfidence. We think we're better than we are. Now to get us warmed up in this interactive mode that we're gonna to try to participate in, even though we can't see or hear each other, I want you all to kind of explore these questions on your own. I wanna ask you a question about how you might have overconfidence. I want to ask you a question. I'm sure you've heard it before. You've maybe not heard it, heard it in a context like this, but I want you to raise your hand on this call if you consider yourself to be an above average driver. Now, I am raising my hand, not to show you that I know how to do it, but because I believe myself to be an above average driver. And if this virtual audience is like the other audiences I presented this material to, I'm guessing 60, 70, maybe even 80% of you are raising your hands actually or mentally right now. You all believe, and it takes a little guts to raise your hand because we know what the old saw is. It cannot be that 51 or 61 or 71% of any population can truly be above average at anything. Surely a few of us perhaps, if we did raise our hand, are doing so out of the illusion that we actually have overconfidence. We may not be as good at driving as we think. Let me contrast that with a second basic bias, the illusion of control. When we have control and when we don't, it turns out, has a big impact in how we assess our success at a particular activity. Let me ask you another warm up question, again, transportation related, just to get us started. We talked a little bit about your driving skill, your collective driving skill. Well, I wanna ask you about flying. 
the last time you were on a commercial uh, airplane. It might have been this week. It might have been two years ago, whenever it was. As you stepped out of the plane, you walked right past the cockpit, probably saw the first officer and the captain doing some paperwork in there. And I want you to raise your hand if on that day, the last time you flew, you believed you had an above average pilot. Now, again, I cannot see your answers. You can't see each other's answers, but take it from me in a real audience of 150 people in a country club ballroom, very few people raise their hand. Often no one raises their hand. Why is this? Well, there's manifold reasons, obviously. Uh, for one, you, they, they did introduce themselves. They always tell you their name, but you probably don't remember who they were. It was very much a short-term relationship. You, act, after all, probably only had one flight with them. Maybe that's not enough evidence to say if they're above average or not. You did survive the flight. We can say that. But even a below average pilot can land the plane safely. In addition to all these reasons, I think another reason why we often don't have an opinion of our pilots is for the really simple reason that we delegated control. Think about when we get on a commercial airplane, if we sit in our seat and behave ourselves, do we influence the safety or outcome of that flight? Of course we don't. We know that we have delegated. Some of us are comfortable with it. Some of us are really uncomfortable with it. We have delegated our corporeal safety, uh, our entire lives to the pilot and the co-pilot. We've delegated our safety to some degree to the airline, uh, to the manufacturer of the aircraft, as scary as it is to think about sometimes. We've delegated some of our safety to the Federal Aviation Administration to keep the skies orderly. We know we're not in charge. And to me, that's why we often don't have a story of why we're better or worse than some alternative, because we've made that choice to delegate control over an outcome. This tends to have a lot of relevance when it comes to our perspective as investors. Now, before we get into the more complex biases, just a couple of really basic building blocks. Again, I want to build on top of these, and we'll examine how they show up in our perspective and in investing in a, little, in a little bit. But just to think about them intuitively, loss aversion and regret avoidance. These are two really particular biases. You might not see them in yourself, but I think you can often see them in others. We tend to want to avoid losses so much, often we will avoid reasonably compensated risks for reasonable gains. In turn, especially when we look backward, or that is when we look forward into decisions and consider their effect of us, their, the effect of those decisions in the past, we often want to avoid regret. I view loss aversion and regret avoidance, if I can continue the transportation theme perhaps a little farther than I should, as sort of the gas and the brakes of a lot of the economic decision-making we make. Too much loss aversion means we're often hitting the brake too much. We're not taking on enough uncertainty to achieve our goals as investors. Too much regret avoidance, I believe, can often mean that we step on the gas. We may take on really risky, really unwise, really concentrated investment opportunities because we can't bear the idea that at some point in the future, we're gonna look back at a decision where we could have accumulated life-changing money, but we decided not to do it. Four really basic biases. And again, the social scientists would say they are ways in controlled experiments where we fail to make optimal decisions, overconfidence, control, loss aversion, regret avoidance. Now, it's not my only task to talk about how we are less than ideal decision makers, although that does that is part of my responsibilities today, but I actually want to make a defense for the human condition. I think there's a reason why, just like the pattern recognition example that we talked about earlier, I think there's a reason why we have these, call them habits, call them cognitive shortcuts, why these are resident in our brains. I believe these so-called mistakes are part of our experience because they, life, they make life more bearable. They, may, they make life more joyful. I don't know about you, but sometimes I need a shot of overconfidence just to get out of bed in the morning and do the best job that I can. I don't care if it's not rational. I don't care if it's not accurate. It makes me feel emotionally better. I believe that is the root behind a lot of these cognitive biases. They may not be economically optimal, but they are often the easiest choice to make in the moment as mortal emotional decision-making beings. 
okay, four really basic biases. And we really haven't talked at all about investing yet. Let's take a step closer to that subject and let's examine three more controversial biases that are probably less familiar to you that to me get closer to the very important acts of allocating wealth uh, that occur when it comes to investments. Let me start with attribution bias. Now, these last three biases that I'm gonna examine with you, they're all the work of one researcher. If there's one grandfather of behavioral finance, one of the first scientists who put these two dom domains together, that is economics and psychology, is definitely Daniel Kahneman. Now, Daniel Kahneman uh, was a professor at UC Berkeley, a professor at Princeton, a professor at Stanford, uh, and he was the first uh, professor of psychology to receive a Nobel Prize in economic sciences. That is how fundamental his contribution is to behavioral finance. Attribution is one of the signature biases that he did a ton of research on. And it's all about the stories that we tell ourselves uh, when they're accurate and when they're not. And it's very easy if you care to, to take the basic four biases that we've talked about and put them together into different combinations to come up with more specific biases like attribution bias. Let me give you the classic example of attribution bias when it comes to investing. Think about a friend, a colleague, a neighbor, maybe even a close family member. If they've made an investment in the past uh, and it was a gutsy, really specific, well-timed investment and it paid off, surely you heard about their success and who do they credit? Well, naturally, they credit themselves. They had the timing, the guts. They knew what to do and when to do it. It may not even been an investment of capital. It could have been an investment of, of time, of joining a partnership, getting an education, just putting in the sweat equity, whatever it was. If it turns out well, we tend, as egoic human beings, to credit ourselves. But now take a different tack on the same question. If you know someone who made an investment decision, maybe a really concentrated investment decision, and it went poorly, it went really badly, maybe it didn't go to zero, but maybe it got close. If you can get them to talk about it, and I would find people tend to talk about where they're successful and not where they fail, there's a lot of bias there alone, but if you can get them to talk about it, what's their narrative gonna be? If they make an investment decision and it doesn't work out, if you get them to talk about it, who will they credit for that failure? In my experience, typically, people will not lay the blame on themselves. They will lay the blame anywhere else that they can. It was a great idea, but it just wasn't the right time in the market. It was a sound investment, but the market went against me. The product was great, but the macroeconomic conditions were terrible. Whatever it is, when we experience success, we want to take credit. That is our wish as human beings. When we experience failure, the ego has left the building. We're really desperate, whether we're conscious of it or not, and Kahneman would argue we are largely unconscious of this. We're really desperate to assign that blame somewhere else. Now, for a single investment decision, perhaps having a little attribution bias doesn't sound all that bad. Kahneman's argument is this is a bias that can accumulate over time, and it can deeply distort what are appropriate decisions for us. I will return to this when we hit our conclusion. Let us move on from attribution bias to my single personal favorite bias of all time, bias I definitely want to spend a little time exploring with you. It's called anchoring bias. And to me, it's a very useful thing to be aware of, certainly related to investing, but I would argue to any opportunity to spend money, including buying goods and services and going out to eat at restaurants. Anchoring is all about how numbers have a powerful and unseen influence on our decision-making. Now to explore anchoring, I wanna recreate one of Kahneman's famous studies with all of you right here. Again, just a thought experiment, but I'll share with you the results. And I wanna see if your intuition matched Kahneman's evidence. Kahneman wanted to examine the role of numbers in decision-making. Of the many, of the many uh, experiments that he conducted, one of the most famous, and he would typically conduct these uh, you know, with his intro to psychology classes at all those great universities, 200 students who are ready to take short quizzes and tests, kids just as smart as all, of, as, all of, as all of we are. One of his experiments was called the Gandhi experiment. It was two trivia questions about the one-time leader of India. And I wanna ask you those two questions now. Hey, do you think Gandhi was older or younger than 118 years old? 
when he died, when he was unfortunately assassinated. And I'd ask all of you, just as Kahneman did, just tick a box, older or younger than 118 years old when he died. That's the easy question. The harder question is the second question. I want your guess at Gandhi's actual age when he was unfortunately assassinated. I want that specific number. Now, I want all of you to harness all the information you might have about Gandhi. Some of you may be very informed. Others may be less informed. You've probably seen some pictures. Maybe you've seen you know, a documentary, maybe a feature film starring an actor portraying Gandhi. Maybe you sat down and read the Wikipedia page yesterday. I don't know. But what I know and what Kahneman knows is when you ask a large population these two questions, they are pulling together all the possible information that they have about Gandhi, well-informed and ill-informed, the population as a whole, we know is gonna have an average guest age in their minds, just as we all do collectively right now. Now, Kahneman of course has a control group. He has another section of his class. We don't have that here today, but I wanna walk through the second time he asked the question in the control group. Again, he gives the students that easy question. Hey, do you think Gandhi was older or younger? But instead of 118, absurdly aged, he goes with absurdly young. Hey, do you think Gandhi was older or younger than nine years old when he led a nation to independence? And it kind of goes without saying, everyone takes the over. Everyone knows that he was not a child when he died. So everyone takes the over, then they get to that second question. The second question is identical. I want your, I want your guest age at Gandhi. I want your guess of Gandhi's age. Now Kahneman would gather all those answers together. He wanted to measure the average guest age. We don't need to slow things down and do that here. I think you can all intuit that you had a number in mind after I first asked you the question. Kahneman's thesis is the following. The entire population is bringing together everything they know. They're including everything they do or don't know about Gandhi, some informed, some well-informed, some poorly informed. But the population is also including that number they were exposed to in the first question. They are unconsciously anchoring to that number. And again, in Kahneman's sections, when he went from 118 absurdly high to nine absurdly low, he was able to drop the average guest age by 17 years. If anchoring has no effect, that average guess age should not change just based on that absurdly high or absurdly low number. Most people, if they were interrogating their decision-making would have claimed that absurdly high or absurdly low did not influence their guess. Kahneman's evidence is quite to the contrary. Numbers influence our decision-making often in unconscious ways. Now, if that sounds like a brutally effective marketing technique, I'm here to tell you that it is one more famous experiment along these lines. Uh, psychology department at the University of California, Davis, put Campbell's soup on sale in every supermarket in the city of Sacramento uh, for one Memorial Day weekend. Not a typically a time when people wanna buy a lot of soup, but they put soup half off, a uniform price in every supermarket in the city of Sacramento. All have the same price, all labeled as half off, in half of the stores, randomly chosen, half of the stores have an additional piece of signage. The additional sign reads, please limit 12 per customer. Half the stores have the limit, half the stores do not. Based on everything we've talked about so far in decision-making and cognitive biases, which set of stores, do you, with the sign or without, do you think sold more Campbell's soup on that long weekend? Well, if you're saying out loud it was the stores with the limit, you would be right. Why is this? Kahneman would argue that as we walk up to that sign and we see that soup is half off, maybe that gets our attention. People like a bargain, all things being equal. But then if we see that sign, part of our unconscious says on some level, let me make sure I understand this correctly. Someone tried to buy 13 cans of Campbell's soup and this store put its foot down. 12 is as far as it goes. Suddenly, my decision-making is a little different. I don't want to miss out on that incredible bargain on soup. I don't want to regret getting this valuable soup that other people want a lot of. Now, I'm not going to buy 12 cans. That is absurd. I was only going to buy one, but seeing as it's on sale, I'll buy two. I'll show them. That's anchoring, using prices to influence decision-making. One more example before we move on. Again, these are about consumption. We haven't gotten to investments just yet. The next time you're in a fine steakhouse, 
think of this principle and look at that menu of the stakes. What are all the stakes there for? All the price points they occupy. There's almost always an entry level steak, a cheap steak, maybe a flank steak. There's almost always a really great 10 or 12 ounce filet mignon. And then there's almost always a few higher end steaks. Now, what is the job thinking through the art of anchoring and the art of managing a restaurant? What is the job of those expensive steaks? I would argue those are delicious cuts of beef. They're at a great margin. The kitchen is happy to sell them. But I would argue part of the job of, of a $130 steak is to make a $59 or $69 filet mignon sound like a raving bargain. That in a nutshell happens in a blink of an eye. That is anchoring. You see all kinds of examples of it, especially uh, in retailing and sales. That is anchoring also shows up strongly in how we reckon investments, because of course, what are investments filled in, filled, filled with? They are filled with numbers and comparisons and rates of return, all of which we can get hung up on in good and bad ways, as we will see. Let's move on to the last bias before I hit my conclusion, make a closing argument, and hopefully get to a few interesting questions. And this is framing. One more Daniel Kahneman bias, easily the most controversial one that I am sharing with you this afternoon, all about how we struggle to make optimal, statistically optimal decisions, especially in the face of uncertainty. And to me, I save this for last because to me, it tees up the challenge that we have as investors in the best way possible. It's another Kahneman bias. And I have one more experiment if you're willing to conduct it with me, all of us here as a thought experiment. It's called the Linda experiment. And this is a test that Kahneman developed in the early 1980s to explore this principle of how we make decisions, the information that we include in making those decisions, and especially how we deal with probabilities and uncertainty. I want to share that question with you, totally unchanged from what it looked like in the 1980s. It's a little dated. It's a word problem. I'm going to read it for you, and I'll give you all a chance, again, just to cognitively play ball here and see how you would answer this question. And of course, I will share with you Kahneman's perspective. So it is a word problem. It's about a hypothetical woman named Linda, and I'll read it for you. Linda is 31, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and she participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. That's everything we know about this hypothetical woman named Linda. Based on that, I want you to choose between the following options. Which is more likely? Which scenario do you find more likely? Option one, Linda is a bank teller. And option two, Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. Take a second to think about it. You're all making a decision in your heads. I know you can't see each other on this call. It's a little frustrating. But here I will step in and I will tell you that in the vast, vast majority, I'm going to say 95% plus, of the audiences in, to, to whom I have, I have shared uh, this question, 60, 70, 80% of the audience, excuse me, chooses option two, bank teller and active in the feminist movement. Kahneman's answer would be that option two is wrong and that option one is correct. Why is this? Well, to explore this question one more time and really unpack it carefully before we hit our conclusion, I want to read the question one more time, and I want to use a kind of couple of uh, famous uh, pop culture characters to do it, uh, sci-fi characters, actually, and that would be the two most famous characters in the Star Trek universe. Uh, don't worry, this is entry-level Star Trek. No one's going to get lost. I think everyone would agree the two most famous characters in the Star Trek universe, of course, are Captain Kirk the captain of the Enterprise and sort of his personality opposite, Mr. Spock. And of course, we all know that Mr. Spock, uh, being a Vulcan or half Vulcan, uh, has pure logic. He has no emotional decision making. Let's let these two characters answer the question again to surface Kahneman's argument at its core. And we know who's going to go first. Captain Kirk's going to go first. Now, Captain Kirk looks at option one, bank teller, doesn't really see it in all these details up here, moves on to option two. Not impossible, but perhaps less likely. Option two, bank teller, yeah, we covered that. And active in the feminist movement. Now we're talking discrimination, social justice, uh, 
outspoken, very bright philosophy, demonstrations. It's like a tractor beam on the enterprise. It just lines up on a gut level. It feels right. So Captain Kirk picks option two. Mr. Spock, of course, goes second. And Mr. Spock, again, being a creature of logic, reads the questions carefully, or the options carefully, I should say, which is more likely. And even Kirk agrees, even Spock agrees, that bank teller is perhaps unlikely. But he doesn't miss a detail in option two. Bank teller and, and active in the feminist movement, as attractive as this is intuitionally at a gut level, she is still a bank teller in the option two a scenario. So however less intuitive it is, it must be the case that the first option alone must even slightly be more likely than still a bank teller and any second term, no matter how intuitive it is. Now you may feel, you may object that Kahneman again is really having his way with us because I still believe, and I have presented this evidence in excess of 100 times to live audiences. If I could invite, if Linda were a real woman and I could invite her onto this call right now, I still personally believe that option two would be vindicated. But this is the key, I think, of the question. Linda is not a real person. It is a hypothetical. It is about probabilities and distributions and uncertainties. If we could simulate a million Lindas and we really appreciate the distinction between option two and option one, it must always be the case that option one, however infinitesimally, is slightly more likely than option two. Now, again, Linda, not a real person but it is a real challenge for us as investors to make sound investment decisions. And often the distinction between a really sound and a less sound investment decision are tiny little percentage point differences, fractions of a percentage point. Here's Kahneman's defense of why we answer the way we do. It is the essence of intuitive heuristics, put another way. When faced with a difficult question, we often answer an easier one instead, usually without noticing the substitution. This is his concern as we apply something like framing or anchoring or attribution bias to something very important, like how we're going to achieve our lifetime goals, how we provide for the next generation of our family, maybe the next two or even three generations of our family, how we support all of our charitable uh, uh, initiatives, whatever it may be, whatever goal our wealth is pointed towards, taking these cognitive shortcuts can get us into trouble. Let me hit my conclusion and wrap up and see if you have any questions. You've been very patient because what I've tried to do is start with our most immediate uh, sensory evidence, like what we see and to explore how we cognitively take shortcuts, even if we're conscious of it, that doesn't stop it from happening. I still see faces in those slides. Perhaps you experienced that too, perhaps not. We've talked about how we can apply these ideas to how we make economic decisions, how we make purchasing decisions. And now let's talk about how these apply to investing. After all, framing is super powerful. We looked at all those details about Linda. None of those details are actually relevant to the logic trick behind the question. But we can get framed. That is, we can pay more attention to what is unimportant than to what is important when it comes to investing. We may have investments in a particular company, especially if it's a company we know really well, maybe even a company where we work, where we have to, or not have to, but we're encouraged to take on an equity position as an employee. We can often, often our assessment of the cost benefit of that investment is a function not of the cold hard data, but it's a function of all the other information that we have about the company. Whether we're optimistic, bullish, or whether we're pessimistic, bearish, we can get over our skis by evaluating these. And it also happens when we think about positions or sectors or country investments where we've experienced in the short-term losses versus when we've experienced gains. Framing can allow us to tell stories about our investments that we probably shouldn't. Extrapolation, to me, this is another way of labeling that pattern recognition that we talked about. Talked about recognizing human faces even when there are none. Well, extrapolation, a version of pattern recognition can happen when we expect markets to keep doing what they're doing. And to me, it is human nature. When we see markets suddenly dropping, part of our amygdala tells us it's going to keep dropping and we need to save ourselves by getting out. That is extrapolation. When markets are going up and we kind of have that greed response where we want to continue to get the benefit of markets going up, we can also extrapolate 
perhaps unwisely assuming that that same exact positive pattern is going to continue unabated. I'm guessing you'll agree with me if you can put aside uh, your personal experience, capital markets are never as good as we hope they are, and they're never as arterially bad as we sometimes fear they are. They're almost always a mixed bag in the middle. Having these, uh, these biases and, and acting on them can get us into trouble. It's a way of backing in to a failure to market time. Hindsight, again, to me, this is all about that notion of fear and greed, especially regretting decisions we haven't made. We can look into the past and with hindsight, we can see when bubbles burst, it was obvious that they would burst. Technology bubble, real estate bubbles, after they burst, they are obvious. Before they burst, that is a very different thing. And again, we can encourage ourselves to extrapolate based on those events in ways that we should not. Familiarity bias is one that we did not explore in an interactive way, but suffice it to say, the evidence is we tend to trust, we tend to want to oversteer to or overinvest in companies that we have heard of, either companies in our town, in our state, in our country, on our planet. Now, I said on our planet. So far, all the operating companies in the human race are still on planet Earth, but that may not continue forever. Even when there are ways to invest on Mars, we probably will still, if we are on planet Earth, have a little bit of what they call home bias or a bias toward that familiarity. Now, that familiarity may, may make us feel good. We may even get lucky and benefit from it. But if we are taking an objective view of how markets work and how capital markets price the uncertainty in companies, where those companies are is something that we really do not have to respond to. It's Dimensional's belief and I believe a lot of the advisors that we work with that those uncertainties are always already baked into the price. This may not be a reason not to own companies you like, but it may be a reason, especially if you have really specific goals, not to oversteer or overconcentrate in those familiar companies. And then lastly, to me, if we want to roll this all this up into one big ball of behavioral uh, kind of uncertainty, it's the sum total of attribution bias. If we have made investment decisions and we've been successful, even active investment decisions, that success can get us into trouble because we believe we can do it again and again, over and over again. And maybe that's a good problem to have because it means we have been very successful. But the opposite is also true. If we have made investment decisions that have gone south and have been acted poorly, that can decay our ability to stay invested, stay diversified, and work a sound diversified investment plan to do its level best to achieve our goals. And those are the two words that I want to close on, diversification and plan, because it's our perspective that having those two things, being diversified, not favoring one or two companies, one or two sectors, even one or two countries, and having an investment plan that is working with an objective counselor and advisor to articulate what you need to do with your money and how to do it, that can help you to get a little bit of distance from these behavioral biases. All the examples I've shared with you, of course, don't really have anything to say about the most important thing to your investment success, which is this the future, the next signal you get, the next bull market, the next bear market, the next piece of good news, the next piece of ruinous news as an investor. We all know, I think if we're being objective, we're gonna get a whole heaping of both of them. If we are diversified, if we have an investment plan, it gives us a powerful choice as an investor. Not every investor has this choice. If I am trying to time markets, if I am favoring just a few companies over all others, I'm probably going to have to engage these biases. And I'm going to have to hope that the cognitive shortcuts I take are right. I'm going to have to hope that I'm more often Mr. Spock than Captain Kirk. But there is an alternative for us. It is not my goal in sharing this evidence with you to turn you into a logic-based uh, alien. Rather, I want you to stay an emotional, happy, educated, successful human being and appreciate that we're always going to have these biases within us. Kahneman says that they cannot be ever fully erased. They can't be ever fully erased from us as individuals. Perhaps even more worryingly, they cannot be fully erased from us as organizations or as groups of individuals. But if we are diversified, if we have a sound investment plan, if we, are, if we are buying objective advice from an advisor, we have this choice not to respond to news, good news or bad news, 
and not to engage the biases the same way we would if we try to take action. So those to me are the top biases and how they can decay our investment success. Last time I wanna say it, but I want you to hear me really clearly, not a function of your smarts, not a function of your wealth, not a function of your emotional stability. I know all of those are present almost by axiom, if you can hear my voice. Rather, these are deeper parts of the cognitive human experience. And it's our belief that diversification and investment plan and working with an advisor, they never remove these biases, but they can keep those biases at bay. And with that, Deanne, I want to throw it back to you and uh, see if there are any questions. I mean, thank you, Christian. Like you just laid it out so beautifully. You gave us more than top five, but I think what you did, um, I mean, was fabulous, first of all, but secondly, you gave us basic biases and then you gave us how we package those together and use those to sabotage ourselves, basically. You know, how do we just sabotage our logical decision-making processes? But I love how you just wrapped up there by sharing that we do have a choice um, and how not every investor has a choice, but investors like ours have a choice. And we get to choose to drown out the noise and, and to filter that out. And we get to choose for our decisions going forward just to be logical by sticking with the plan and staying diversified. Um, and so, you know, thank you again for, for sharing with us the ways that we naturally um, work against ourselves, but how we can overcome those as well. Um, Betsy, do we have any questions? Yes, we have a couple of questions. Christian, thank you so much. That was just fascinating for me. Um, I'm guilty of a lot of these and I seem to be the only one who had confidence in her pilot on her most recent flight. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I hope you always have confidence. I, I hope that's always a place. I thought he was Either above average. average or not might be a little higher bar, but I'm, I'm glad you had confidence at least. Yes. Um, well, one question we had, somebody asked, to what degree does the news we pay attention to influence our biases? Yeah, I would say uh, I would say there is the potential for it to be very high, right? Because I, mean, I would say if we go to, you know, if we pick up, attribution bias, I, I kind of, I provided a narrative about attribution bias of ourselves, our assessment of ourselves. People also, I believe, can have really huge attrib attribution bias about what is happening in the news. That is, what is the headline on their paper? If they're old enough like me, they still get a physical paper. Or what is the Chiron on, you know, the cable TV they're watching? Or what are the, you know, Twitter messages they're getting? Uh, and you can also have attribution bias there where you tell where you tell yourself all of these units of news, I'm going to discriminate between which ones I can ignore and which I have to take action on. And even the urge to take action on a few, I think that takes us to down a dangerous road because we have suddenly have to do a bunch of things. Number one, we have to make a really fraught decision, not about our, our long term goals not about our long-term rates of return, but rather what's happening in the noise in a single day. Even if we make that decision, then it's our task as now active investors to wander, to wade into capital markets, to go into the stock and bonds and commodity markets and to transact. And now when we transact, we need to ask ourselves, okay, was that news bad enough that I should buy at a discount of you know, $50 or a discount of $100? What is the new price that accurately reflects this news. Suddenly I need to do the kind of calculus that I would argue it takes tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of investors to collectively do when prices, the chaotic movement of prices that nobody controls reflect all of that uncertainty. And this is my last statement about that wish to digest the news. If I do all that stuff, I can really never stop because of course, what happens every day? Well, the prices change. And the headlines change again. Maybe the news gets better. Now do I need to go back to what I was doing before? People who take this route of responding to the news, my, they may be successful, they may be less successful. I would argue whether they're more or less successful, the biases they have are going to really distort their ability to say, am I achieving my goal? And a focus on the goal we believe is way more important than missing a single day of bad returns or capturing a single day of good returns. The bottom line, you know, everyone's situation is different, of course, and I can't see into everyone's situation now, but based on all the conversations I've had with hundreds of end investors, 
I know that for most clients, the wealth of the, the lifetime of their wealth is often going to be longer than their own lifetime. This is an endurance sport for all of us. It is a marathon. It's not about what we're doing in a minute or an hour or a day, or even a full day of market returns, but rather what happens over accumulation of years and decades, especially if it's part of our plan to pass our wealth on to someone else. And I very rarely meet someone who says, uh, I'm trying to take it with me. So I feel like having that long time frame is a way for us. Doesn't mean we have to stop paying attention to the news. There's a lot of reasons why I think you know consuming the news is healthy, but we don't have to connect it to our next investment decision. And again, it comes back to this idea that if we have a plan, it's the choice we can make to say, I see that the news is really good, but I'm not going to change what I'm doing because my guess is the market has already baked that change into prices. Yep, that's certainly the case for us and for our clients and what we talk with every day to people we work with too. So thank you. Um, one other question was if these biases occur in us as individuals, can they also occur in companies like elevate our company or your company to dimensional funds? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Kahneman, if you, you know, I didn't mention the book as we were moving through there, but I will mention it here. Uh, you saw a picture of thinking fast and slow and and that, unlike uh, Jason Zweig's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is very long. It looks really impressive on a shelf. It takes time to read through. That being said, it is a really fascinating read. And I'm going to say more of the examples in that book are about the failure of organizations to make sound decisions. So my first level answer is yes. Any organization is made up of mortal people. Mortal people have these biases. So without good checks and balances... It's our belief, and it's the evidence you can find in Kahneman's book, that organizations can uh, fall a prey to these decisions. I would say what sets Dimensional apart and Elevate apart and a lot of the firms, and it's not unique to either of us, but it sets the firms that have our perspective in common apart, is our belief in the long-term evidence. And we can look to long-term evidence the same way that we use evidence in healthcare and medicine to determine courses of action. The financial advisors that Dimensional works with and what Dimensional is doing, we're not just walking to the office every day and sitting as a committee and trying to guess what's gonna happen in markets tomorrow. Rather, what we're using is we're using long-term data sets to say, we know we can't control markets tomorrow or the day after that or the day after that, but can we look to the evidence to guide us into how to make sound investments that again, are going to have lifespans of months, quarters, years, and even decades. Does that ever fully remove these cognitive biases? I don't think I would be intellectually honest to say yes, but I believe that firms like Dimensional and the advisors we work with, we put into place a lot of checks and balances. Some of them are procedural, some of them are based on data, others are just based on, on having oversight, many different people who help to make decisions to try to minimize those effects. But I wouldn't want you to hear me that any company magically reduces these biases to zero. I would say our perspective is that's just not part of the human condition. Well, we cannot thank you enough for all of your time today. And I know it took a lot to put this presentation together. I know it was fascinating for me and Deanne and then all of our viewers today. Uh, we are going to put this up on our YouTube channel. And if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, you'll want to do that. You'll just go to YouTube and search for Elevate Wealth Advisory in Athens, Georgia, and just hit that little subscribe button. You'll get a notification every time we put something new up there. Um, part of our core values at Elevate is lifelong learning. And one of the ways we do that is these monthly webinars. Um, this has been just a great topic. We've had a lot of people ask us for stuff like this. So this is great. And then we also are putting out weekly webinar or weekly WealthWise video series. And they're short little topics of one to two minutes just every week that we roll that out. So be sure you subscribe to that. And if you can't find it, just go to our our website, elevate-wealth.com. And at the very bottom, you can link to our Facebook, Instagram, our LinkedIn, and then also our YouTube page. Well, Christian, thank you again for all of your time today. You've just been absolutely wonderful and we hope to have you on again soon. Thank you so much. I had a blast. And thank you, Dan, thank you so much as always for hosting these great, um, these great webinars. Glad to do it. And thank you so much, Christian. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. And if we did not get to your question, just feel free to email us at info at elevate-wealth.com. And we'll see you soon.
Bye.